But it is a lesson that we should examine ourselves because we often talk about other churches and say, well, they're not following the pattern that we find in the Bible. But let's never forget, we can be involved in that too. We should examine what we are doing in our lives. We shouldn't come along and say, well, those other people, now they're lost. And then forget to take a look that we could be in that same situation. So that's the point of today's lesson. That's what we're going to be looking at. So in trying to determine what the Bible says on a given topic, it is only natural to try and find every verse that deals with that topic and then combine these verses together to form Bible doctrine. The easiest way to do that is to use what is known as a Bible concordance. For instance, if I wanted to find every verse in the Bible that contained the word baptism in it, I would search baptism in my concordance. And if I was using the English Standard Version of the Bible, I would find 20 places in the New Testament where the word baptism is used. If I didn't have a concordance, because those are books that generally preachers have, but if I didn't have a concordance, most Bibles come with what are known as cross-references. You will notice them down the center column if you have them in your Bible. Those are cross-references, and they'll have those little letters, and you have to search the verses for where those little letters are. And what that does is it works in the same way as a concordance, the only difference being that the publisher of that specific Bible has determined what verses are relevant to the passage you've been reading instead of you making that decision yourself if you use a concordance. And using a concordance or a cross-reference to study the Bible is okay as long as you read the specific context that the word is contained in so as not to twist the meaning of the passage to suit whatever beliefs you might have. Going back to my example on baptism, most of the time we're looking up baptism, it would be to determine what the Bible says about water baptism as it concerns Christians today. However, the word baptism does not always refer to water baptism that Christians are to submit themselves to. For in Mark 10, 38, 39, the word baptism is used to denote Christ's sufferings. While in Mark 1, verse 4, the word baptism is used to denote John's baptism baptism of repentance. So while those verses might be speaking of baptism, they shouldn't be used to teach about water baptism for Christians today. All this brings us to today's topic, which is salvation by grace. As with baptism, Bible readers want to know everything that the Bible says about salvation. So they not only look up specific words, but more advanced learners might even try and find context where, the sal where salvation <coughs> So the topic of salvation is being talked about, but the word itself, either saved or salvation, is not used in those verses. And in the not-so-distant not so past, we discussed what the, that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace, though not by grace alone. What we're going to be talking about today, however, is whether a person, once they become a Christian and have received grace, the forgiveness of their past sins, whether that person can fall from grace and be lost. If you listen to many in the religious world, the answer to that question is no. Once grace is received, one is forever saved and can never be lost and cast to hell by God because when you become a Christian, God forgives all your past, present, and future sins in the blood of Christ. This is sometimes referred to as the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Now the question is, are there verses in the Bible to teach this? And the answer is, yes, there are. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Paul writes, 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, if you were talking to a person who believed that once you're saved, you're always going to be saved, the argument would go like this. Once we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit seals us or claims us as his own. And since God is all-powerful, nobody can break this seal, not even ourselves. And therefore, that's why we can be sealed unto the day of redemption, of course, which is the judgment day. And you want to know what? That sounds like a pretty strong argument. Only one verse, but a strong argument. We'll leave that verse for now, and we'll come back to it later on in this lesson. Now what I'd like you to do is turn to Ephesians chapter 1, a few pages before. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, beginning verse 13. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. According to those who believe that once you're saved, you're always going to be saved, what does this passage say? Again, we have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of the inheritance until the judgment day. Now, if something is guaranteed, it will come to pass, meaning we can never lose that guarantee. Otherwise, it really wouldn't be a guarantee. Again, this sounds like a pretty strong argument. Now, let's turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verses 27 to 29. John 10, beginning verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. This is one of the favorite verses of those who believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. For I hear it on the radio every time they talk about it. Now, what do they say this verse means? Well, it means that Christ's sheep hear his voice. And of course, the sheep in this passage is talking about Christians. What does Christ do for his sheep? Well, he gives them eternal life, and they will never perish. But even more than that, nobody can snatch them or grab them out of his hand because God is greater than all, making it impossible for anyone to snatch Jesus' sheep from his hand. Therefore, once you're Jesus' sheep, you'll always be Jesus' sheep and thus never be lost. So now we have three verses, and our argument is getting even stronger that this doctrine looks to be true. Although there are many more verses we could cover, we're going to look at one more. As such, will be sufficient for our study today. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Let's read verses 38 and 39. Romans 8, beginning at verse 38. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a very powerful verse. And properly used is quite a comfort to Christians. What can separate us from the love of God? Absolutely nothing. This passage is, of course, talking to Christians again, and it is used to prove that once we're saved, nothing can separate us from the love of God, and therefore, our salvation can never be lost. Again, we'll talk about if this is actually what the passage is teaching later on in a few moments. But for now, I'd like you to notice what we just did. We went to four verses and read those verses without putting them into their context. It's like overhearing a conversation where you only hear a portion of the conversation and then try to piece together the entirety of what was being said. Sometimes what you come up with is correct, but most of the time hearing something out of context will lead us to the wrong conclusions. Reading verses without looking at their context is especially dangerous when examining scriptures, for if we draw the wrong conclusions here, we're actually putting our soul and other people's souls in danger by believing something that God did not say. One thing that Bible believers know about Scripture is that 
One scripture will not contradict another scripture. So if we examine a passage that appears to contradict a doctrine we believe, it is not the Bible that is wrong. It's our beliefs that are wrong and need to be changed. So, all we need to do to show that the Bible does not teach that once we're saved, we're always saved, is find a passage, put it into its context, that will teach that. So now turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. That's going to be the main focus of the rest of this lesson. Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to read verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 3, beginning verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now verse 12 clearly says that a person can fall away from God. In other words, fall away from God's grace. Now this presents a problem if we believe that one can never fall away from God or His grace. Now there are two solutions given to this problem. Solution number one is the writer isn't speaking to the saved here. He might have been simply speaking to unsaved Jews. Or solution number two is, those people he was speaking of might have thought they were saved, but they really weren't saved to begin with, and therefore it is those people who can fall away. So, let's test that by actually reading the context, which of course begins in verse 1 of chapter 3, and actually goes all the way to verse 13 of chapter 4. While we read this entire section, let's pay attention as to who the audience is, what is being discussed, and whether or not a person who was once saved by God could be lost if they leave the faith. So let's begin by reading Hebrews chapter 3, beginning of verse 1, all the way to chapter 4, 13. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle, and, or the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And if we are his house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of the testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, 
And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Who is the Hebrew writer talking to? Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, Holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling. He is talking to Christians in this chapter. Those who have been saved by being baptized into Christ. This takes away solution number 1, which he wasn't talking to Christians in verse 12. Was he speaking to people who at that point in time were going to heaven? They were on the road to heaven. Unless there is some other heavenly calling that I'm not aware of, then yes, he was speaking to people who were actually saved, not in mere thought, but in actuality, which takes away solution number two. Now, what was the Hebrew writer talking about in this context? Well, the people who this letter was written to were being tempted to leave Christ and go back to the law of Moses, a law that could not remit sins. For Hebrews 10 verse 4 says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot remit sins. In Hebrews 3 and 4, he uses the Old Testament example of Israel to make his point. He's actually quoting Psalms 95 verses 7 to 11 in this chapter. Now, the children of Israel were God's chosen people under the Old Covenant, the people through whom God made and kept His promises. In the beginning, the children of Israel followed God as Moses led them out of Egypt. But the people who came out of Egypt, the ones who crossed the Red Sea, failed to reach the Promised Land, the land of physical rest for their wanderings. Why? Because they rebelled against God. As punishment, they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness until that rebellious generation died off. Had God broken his promise? No, he still kept his promise. It was the children of Israel who rebelled. You see, what people fail to realize is God's promises of this land, this rest, was always conditional on obedience. In Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 and 19, we read, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey my commandments of the Lord, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if you turn your heart away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. God promised them rest and a land of rest, but it was conditional on continued obedience. And even in the Old Testament, God promised Israel spiritual rest. For Psalms 95, the passage quoted by the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 3 was written long after Joshua had led Israel into the promised land to possess it. In Psalms 95, David was warning that if they disobeyed God today, they would not enter his rest, exactly as those who disobeyed in the time of Moses. Just as the physical rest to Israel was conditional on obedience, so too was the spiritual rest, which of course is heaven. Now this Old Testament example brings us to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, which says, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. So just like there could be an unbelieving heart in Israel, the people of God 
and prevented them from entering into God's rest. There could be an unbelieving heart in Christians, the people of God, that will prevent us from entering into God's rest in heaven. That's because this rest promised to Christians by God is still in our future. How do I know this? Because Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, Let us therefore strive or work to enter that rest. The Hebrew Christians had not yet obtained God's rest. They were on the way, being led by the Holy Spirit out of bondage from sin, their Egypt. But until they reach the promised land, they continue to follow. Since salvation in heaven is still in our future, we can fall short if we decide to go back into disobedience. Chapter 4 concludes by telling the Hebrews and us not to fool ourselves into thinking that God doesn't know the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. Or his word will strip us naked, able, able to divide the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, things that are so closely held together, they might as well be one thing. He will know whether we are righteous or not. So let's continue working to serve and obey God. So Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 teaches us that not only is it possible for Christians to fall away from God, that in fact Christians do fall away from God. But Scripture doesn't contradict Scripture. So what are those other verses that we read earlier talking about? So let's go back and reread Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now this passage, of course, is talking about the seal of the Holy Spirit. Sealing was done to guarantee that the contents of something were not tampered by another. In Matthew 27, 66, we find that Jesus' tomb was sealed. In that case, soft clay would have been placed across the opening between the tomb and the stone that was used to close the tomb. An embossed seal or a mold would mark the clay and any shifting of the stone would break the seal, demonstrating that the tomb had been tampered with. In the case of Ephesians 4 verse 30, Christians are sealed with the Holy Spirit, were marked as his property. Paul said the same thing in 2 Timothy 2.19, which reads, But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. But what was Paul's warning in the first part of Ephesians 4 verse 30? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit is to rebel against God's authority. I know that because that's what the children of Israel did, as described in Isaiah 63.10. Isaiah 63.10 says, But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, therefore he turned to be their enemy, and himself fought against them. As we said earlier, Israel had been the chosen possession of God, but they could rebel, and God could turn against them. If they returned, God would be for them. But if they rebelled, he wouldn't accept them. The same is true today. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, as long as we don't grieve the Holy Spirit and rebel against him, refusing to accept his authority and follow his word. So the problem in Ephesians 4 verse 30 is not a problem with God. It's a problem with us and our willingness to submit. And basically, that's what we're going to see for the rest of these three other verses that we read earlier as well. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14 said, In whom you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. These verses are an allusion to the same promise made to Israel under their covenant. That promise is found in Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 10. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, 
For you are the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out, of, out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord, is your, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with those who hate them, who hate him. He will repay them to his face. God guaranteed that Israel would receive Canaan, and his selection of Israel was part of keeping that promise. God has promised Christians heaven, that spiritual Canaan, if you will. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of that promise, for it is by the work of the Holy Spirit in inspiring the apostles and prophets that we have received the word of promise. So in effect, God is telling Christians that you can take his word to the bank Christians will receive heaven. However, God didn't give Israel the land of Canaan without conditions, and they lost the land when they rebelled. God didn't go back on his word. Israel did. So bringing it forward to the New Testament times, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, God has promised an inheritance to Christians. No external force can remove this inheritance from us, but we can rebel against God and forfeit our right to the inheritance. Again, the problem is not with God, it is with us, and us alone. The same thing can be said of John 10, 27-29, and Romans 8, 38-39. In John 10, Jesus promises his sheep eternal life, life will, that will not perish. Nobody can prevent this from happening, not the devil, not our friends, not even God himself. But there is an assumption made in this chapter that eternal life is granted immediately on becoming Christ's sheep. But that's not stated here. For Hebrews 4, 1 to 11 told us that eternal life is in our future. Now with that being the case, even though the devil can't prevent us from going to heaven, we can prevent ourselves from going to heaven. Because we as Jesus' sheep can rebel and lose our right to the promise. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 we read, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Romans 8, 38, 39 says that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. That means not anything that God created, the devil, our parents, our brothers and sisters in Christ, none of that can separate us from the love of God. But unrepented sin can and does separate us from God. That's because the idea of all of our sins, past, present, and future, being washed away in the blood of Christ when we become a Christian, is simply not true. Hebrews 10, verses 26 to 31 says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The passage here in Hebrews 10 is talking to Christians, for it is Christians who receive the knowledge of the truth, and it is Christians who are sanctified by the blood of the covenant. When I become a Christian, all my past and present sins are washed away in the blood of Christ, and I am raised up out of the waters of baptism to walk in newness of life. But 1 John 1 verse 8 says that I will sin again. What do I do then? Do I get rebaptized every time I sin? I'd be able to line up as far as the eye could see if we had to do that. Verse 9 of 1 John 1, though, says, I am to confess those sins to God and ask for forgiveness. What happens if I don't ask God to forgive my sins? Then I continue to live in sin and will be lost if I die in that condition or Christ comes first. It's just that simple. 
Now before closing, we must address the elephant in the room, which is, can we be confident in our salvation? The doctrine of once saved, always saved was created to provide Christians comfort and confidence in their salvation. That's what Luther and everyone else did because when you were a Catholic, you lived in fear of going to hell every day. That's what Catholic doctrine did. So Luther and Calvin and many of those other uh, preachers at that time came along and said, well, the scriptures don't teach that. They teach one saved, always saved. And so they provide Christians or so-called Christians with a comfort and confidence in their salvation, but a false comfort and a false confidence. But let's not kid ourselves. The Bible does teach that we can be confident in our salvation. Turn now to Hebrews 6. Let's start reading at verse 9. Hebrews 6, verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever out of, after the order of Melchizedek. How do we inherit the promises of God? We inherit them the same way Abraham did, by faith. Unlike what some people might tell you, it is possible to live by faith and follow what God's word said. Paul told Timothy that in 2 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, truly furnished into all good works. We can live by faith. We can follow what the Word of God says, and therefore we can have confidence in the promises of God, which is our salvation. God fulfilled His promises to Abraham, He fulfilled His promises to David, and He will fulfill His promises to us. All He asks of us is that we will faithfully serve Him. Will we sin from time to time? Yes. But one who faithfully follows God will do what God says is the remedy for that which is to repent and pray for forgiveness. So while it is possible to fall from grace, that should not worry a Christian. For it is also possible to be saved by grace through faith. God has always kept his promises. He has never failed once. The question is, will you obey him in faith and receive what he has promised? I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Maintain the honors of His word, the glory of